Hello everyone. This is the second tutorial for ENGG 24308 Probability and Statistics for Engineers. Some students told us the last tutorial video sounds not very clear, so we will add subtitle to the video this time. And if you have any further comments on our tutorial, either the video or the 30 minutes discussion, please feel free to tell us your ideas. I believe any of your comments will improve our tutorial. Okay, now let's cut to the chase. Last week, our professor has introduced some descriptive statistics of the population and sample, such as mean, median, variance, standard deviation, and so on. Then, when you encounter with the word sample, have you asked yourself, why do we need sampling? When I asked myself, I thought of some simple reasons as follows. An obvious one is that the population is always too large. Sampling can reduce cost, and is more speedy when data is needed urgently. For example, as we know, the world population is larger than 7 billion today. It's almost impossible to know the monthly income of every person in the world. Such a survey will consume too much money, human resource, and time. Moreover, surveys of monthly income and something like employment rate may be needed urgently, because governments often use this data to adjust their policies. If we investigate everyone in the country, then after a long time, when we obtain the data, all the society may have already changed and our data become out of date. But everything would be much better if we only investigate some proportion of the population. That is what we call sample. Another reason why we need sampling is that some statistics are obtained through irreversible process. Here, by irreversible process, I refer to that if we investigate into something, the object that is investigated into will become useless because of our investigation. A simple example is that we want to know how delicious the bread in a burglary test. Nobody will be allowed to taste all the bread in the burglary. Even someone is allowed to do so, I believe he will not be able to eat up all the bread. In fact, there's no need to test all. If we want to know how the bread tests, testing some of them will be okay. This is another example of sampling. Okay, let's stop here. There are some other reasons or we see advantages of sampling. Maybe everyone can give his or her own reasons. You can think of your reasons after class. After sampling, when we get different samples, then how can we estimate the population through samples? We will discuss that by comparing some basic characteristics of the population and sample, which are respectively called population parameters and sample statistics. If we fix the population that we focus on, the parameters are always unchanged, but the sample statistics will change with the samples we choose. We can see from the table the most important and commonly used characteristics, mean, variance, and standard deviation of population in a sample looks almost the same correspondingly except for the number of data that are measured. Be careful that in the sample variance and standard deviation, n minus 1 is divided instead of n. Professor Chen has posted a bonus question about this on Piazza, but I noticed that no student followed that. It's not so hard as you think. I suggest you to read something about Bayesian correction which may help. Comparing different samples, a good sample must be representative, 
such that we can estimate the population with a smaller deviation. That is, samples must be random drawn. Each element has an equal opportunity to be selected, and each selection is independent of another. After obtaining these population parameters or sample statistics, we may ask that how can we use these characteristics to help us study the population? Our professor has given us an example in class. We can deduce how concentrated are the population around the mean from the population parameters. Sharp shifts in the quality is one of the deductions. Introduced in class, and there are others such as Markov's inequality, central limit theorem, which will be studied later. Now we first consider Chebyshev's inequality here. Given population parameters mean mu and standard deviation sigma, and any positive k, we have the following Chebyshev's inequality, which gives us. A lower bound on the proportion of data that lie around the mean within k times standard deviation. It can be easily illustrated through this finger. This is the mean mu x, and this interval is k times standard deviation around the mean. So, what we are focusing on. Is the proportion of data that lie in this interval, and Chebyshev's inequality gives us a lower bound on this proportion. Well, we may first further ask that, since in real life we often know the sample statistics from sampling, but may not know the population parameters for some reasons, then. Can we study the concentration properties through the sample statistics? Okay, I will leave this as a home thinking problem. Next, we consider some special cases regarding Chebyshev's inequality. Now, we want to know how many data lie around the mean within one standard deviation. That is, we take k equals one. Then Chebyshev's inequality becomes N one over n is greater than or equal to zero, which is trivial because the proportion of data lie within any interval should be non-negative. In other words, when k equals one, or in fact when k is less than or equal to one, Chebyshev's inequality will be trivial and thus useless. Next, we consider another case, which is a complement of. Chebyshev's inequality. Recall that in Chebyshev's inequality, n sub k denotes the number of data that lie within k times standard deviation around the mean. Now we denote n sub k prime as the number of data that lie outside k times standard deviation from the mean. Then, can we decide how many data lie within this interval? The answer is yes. There is an upper bound for this, and the first method to derive this is just repeat similarly what the professor did in class to obtain the lower bound in Chebyshev's inequality. The second approach is utilizing Chebyshev's inequality. From the finger, we can see that n k. Plus n k prime equals n. So n k prime over n equals one minus n k over n. This is obvious. Less than or equal to one over k squared, according to Chebyshev's inequality. Now we consider another example where all the data are integers, and we assume the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Then the proportion of data that lie around zero within k units is greater than or equal to 
1 minus 1 over k plus 1 squared, which provides a sharper bound than Chebyshev's inequality. This is because in Chebyshev's inequality, the interval is open, but if the data are integers, we can shrink the interval by two units from k plus 1 to k. Here is an exact example where we take k equals 2. If we bound the proportion directly by Chebyshev's inequality, it should be 3 over 4. But if we improve the bound with the integer constraint, we will get 8 over 9, which is better than 3 over 4. Now let's consider another extension. Have you noticed that till now, we can only deal with symmetric intervals. If the two subintervals beside the mean are different, can we bound the number of data that lie in such an interval? Okay, now let me show you how we obtain the bound. Without loss of generality, assume k2 is greater than or equal to k1. We first complete the two symmetric intervals. The first is k1 times standard deviation around the mean. The other is k2 times standard deviation around the mean. Since a lower bound is needed, we should bound the proportion n sub k over n by smaller interval, which yields the result 1 minus 1 over k1 squared. The other one could not be used to bound the desired proportion because from the two inequalities, we get no information about nk over n with, with respect to k2. Now look at the lower bound. We obtaining the bound, we have discarded a part of the interval. So, we may ask, is there a sharper bound if we take the whole interval into account? In fact, there is. Let's leave it as an take-home exercise. As we just said, Chebyshev's inequality shows the concentration of data. It applies to all kinds of data. Then, if we add some more constraints, can we get some more elegant results? Now let's have a look. We consider the example where all the data are non-active and the mean is given as mu x. We can then upper bound the proportion of data that lie beyond k times the mean. This result is called Markov's inequality. Although Markov is a student of Chebyshev, Markov's inequality can be used to prove Chebyshev's inequality. I will skip this proof and leave it for our later discussion. Just now, we have talked about the case where Chebyshev's inequality is trivial. Then, I want to ask here, will Markov's inequality be trivial in some cases? If yes, when will it be trivial? You can think about this after class. Now we prove Markov's inequality. We begin with the definition of mean. By definition, the mean of the population equals 1 over n times the summation of all data. So we rewrite the summation as the expansion in decreased order. We can see that each of the first n sub k terms of the summation are greater than or equal to k times the mean, which is by assumption. And the rest is greater than or equal to zero by the non-negative constraint. Thus, the summation must be greater than or equal to k times the mean, times n sub k, 
which implies that the mean is greater than or equal to k times the mean times n sub k over n. Then, lastly, we get the desired Markov's inequality, namely, among all non-negative data with mean mu, the proportion of data which are greater than or equal to k times the mean will not exceed one over k. Now we complete the proof. And this is the end of the second video tutorial. There will be some other interesting examples later in our discussion. Now let's begin our discussion. Thank you.